Hi everybody and welcome to Independent Art Storytime. So normally I bring my stories to you from my office, which is upstairs in the loft. But as George would say, it's so blooming hot up there today, I've had to come downstairs. I know I look like I'm being interviewed on Newsnight. Um, but yeah, I guarantee that the bookshelves were here before lockdown. Um, I'm not trying to make myself look any cleverer than I am. In fact, they're mainly murder mysteries or not my books at all. Anyway, we're not here to talk about my interior decoration. We're here to hear a story. And the story today is The Fib from The Fib by George Layton. So here we go. The Fib is set on a day which is considerably cooler than we have today. Oh wow, I was not half snug in bed. I could hear my mum calling to get up, but I was ever so, it was ever so cold. And every time I breathed, I could see a puff of air. The window was covered in frost, and I just couldn't get myself out of bed. Are you up? I've called you three times already. Yeah, mum, of course I am. I knew it was a lie, but I just wanted to have a few more minutes in bed. It was so cosy. You better be, because I'm not telling you again. That was another lie. She was always telling me again. Just you be quick, young man, and frame up, or you'll be late for school. Oh, school. If only I didn't have to go. Thank goodness you were breaking up for Christmas soon. I don't mind school. I like it, quite like it sometimes. But today was Monday, and Monday was football. And I hate blooming football. It wouldn't be so bad if I had proper kit, but I had to play in these old-fashioned shorts and boots that my mum had got from Uncle Kevin. They were huge. Miles too big for me. Gordon Barraclough and Dad had bought him a Bobby Charlton strip and Bobby Charlton boots. No wonder he's a better player than me. My mum said she couldn't see what was wrong with me kit and she couldn't understand that I felt silly and all the other lads laughed at me. Even Tony, and he's my best friend. She said she wasn't going to waste good money on new boots and shorts when I had a perfectly good set already. But Mum, they all laugh at me, especially Gordon Barraclough. Well, laugh back at them. You're big enough, aren't you? Don't be such a Jessie. She just couldn't understand. You tell them that your Uncle Kevin played in those boots when he was a lad and he scored thousands of goals. Blimey, that shows you how old my kit is. My Uncle Kevin's 29. I snuggled down the bed a bit more and pulled the pillow under the blankets with me. I'm coming upstairs and if I find you not up, there'll be trouble and I'm not telling you again. Oh, heck. I forced myself out of bed onto the freezing lino and got into my underpants. Oh, they were cold. I looked out of the window, didn't half look miserable. I felt miserable. I was miserable. Another 90 minutes standing between the posts, letting in goal after goal with Gordon Barraclough shouting at me. Why did you like die for it, you lazy beggar? Why didn't he die for it? Why didn't he go in goal? Why didn't he shut his rotten mouth? Oh no, he was always centre forward, wasn't he? Because he was Bobby Charlton. As I stood looking out the window, I started wondering how I could get out of going to football. I know. I'd tell my mum I wasn't feeling well. I'd tell her I'd got a cold. Nope, a sore throat. Nope, she'd look. Swollen glands. Yeah, that's what I'd tell her. Swollen glands. Oh no, she'd feel. What could I say was wrong with me? Earache. Yeah, earache. And I'd ask her to write me a note. I'd ask her after breakfast. Well, it was only a fib, wasn't it? You're very quiet. Didn't you enjoy your breakfast? Uh, well, I don't feel very well, Mum. I think I've got earache. You think you've got earache? I mean, I have got earache, definitely, in my ear. Which ear? What? Are you going deaf as well? I said, which ear? Uh, me right ear. Perhaps you better write me a note to get me off football. No, love, it'll be good for you to go to football. You get some fresh air. I'll write to Mr Melrose and ask him to let you go in goal so you don't have to run around too much. She'd write me a note to ask if I could go in. 
Melrose didn't need a note for me to go in goal. I was always shoved in goal. Me and Norbert Lytella were always in goal because we were the worst players. Norbert didn't care. He were never bothered when people shouted at him. He just told them to get lost. He never even changed for football. He just stuffed his socks into his trousers and said it was a tracksuit. He knew he looked as deft as me and me Uncle Kevin's old kit. Mum, don't bother writing me a note. I'll be all right. Well, I was only thinking of you. If you've got earache, I don't want you to run around too much. I don't want you in bed for Christmas. I'll be all right. Do you know, I don't think my mum believed I'd got earache. I know I was fibbing, but even if I had got earache, I don't think she'd believe me. Mums are like that. You sure you're all right? Yeah, I'll be okay. How could my mum know that when I was in goal, I ran around twice as much anyway? Every time the other team scored, I had to belt halfway across the playing field to fetch the ball back. Well, finish your Rice Krispies. Tony will be here in a minute. Tony called for me every morning. I was never ready. I was just finishing my toast when I heard my mum let him in. He came through to the kitchen. Oh, come on. You're never ready. It won't be a minute. We'll be late. We'll miss the football bus. We didn't have any playing fields at our school, so we had to have a special bus to Bankfield Top, about two miles away. If we miss the bus, I'll do you. We won't miss the bus. Stop panicking. I wouldn't have minded missing it. Anyway, we might not have football today. It's very frosty. Of course we will. You aren't half soft, are you? It was all right for Tony. He wasn't bad at football. Nobody shouted at him. It's all right for you. Nobody shouts at you. Well, who shouts at you? Gordon Barraclough. Well, you don't want to take any notice. Hurry up. Mum came down with me kit. Yeah, hurry up or you'll miss your bus for football. We won't miss our rotten bus for rotten football. She gave me a clout on the back of my head. Tony laughed. And you can stop laughing, Tony Wayne, right? And she gave him a clout as well. Now go on, both of you. We ran to school, got there in plenty of time, I knew we would, and everyone was getting on the bus. We didn't have to go to assembly when it was football. Gordon Barrowclough was on the top deck with his head out of one of the windows, and he saw me coming. Hey, Gordon Banks! He always called me that because he thinks Gordon Banks was the best goalie ever. And he reckons he was called Gordon after Gordon Banks. Yay, Gordon Banks! How many goals are you going to let in today? Tony nudged me. Don't take any notice. Come on, Gordon Banks, how many goals am I going to get in against you? Tony nudged me again. Ignore him. Or am I going to get lumbered with you on my side, eh? He's only egging you on. Ignore him. Yes, I'll ignore him. That's the best thing. I'll ignore him. If you're on my side, Gordon Banks, you better not let any goals in or I'll do you. Just ignore him. That's the best thing. Get lost, Barraclough, you rotten big head. I couldn't ignore him. Tony was shaking his head. I told you to ignore him. I couldn't. Gordon still had his head out of the window. I'm coming down to get you. And he would have done too, if it hadn't been for Norbert. Just as Gordon was going back into the bus, Norbert wound the window up, so Gordon's head was stuck. It must have hurt him. Well, it could have choked him. You're a maniac, Lightowler. You could have choked me. Norbert just laughed and Gordon thumped him right in the neck and they started fighting. Tony and me ran up the stairs to watch. They were rolling in the aisle. Norbert got on top of Gordon and put his knees on his shoulders and everyone was watching now and shouting, Fight! 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 The bell hadn't gone for assembly yet and other lads from the playground came out to watch. Fight! 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 Gordon pushed Norbert off him and they rolled under a seat. Then they rolled out into the aisle again. Only this time, Gordon was on top and he thumped Norbert right in the middle of the chest. Hard. It hurt him and Norbert got his mad up. I really wanted him to do Gordon. Go on, Norbert, do him. Just then, somebody clouted me on the back of the head, right where my mum had hit me that morning. And I turned round to belt whoever it was. Who do you think you're thumping? Oh, morning, Mr Melrose. He pushed me away and went over to where Norbert and Gordon were still fighting. He grabbed them both by their jackets 
and pulled them apart. It used to be in the commandos, did Mr Melrose. Animals, you're a pair of animals, what are you? Neither of them said anything. He was still holding them by their jackets. He shook them. What are you, Light Owler? A pair of animals. Gordon? A pair of animals, sir. It wasn't my fault, sir. He started it, sir. He went up that window, sir, and got my head stuck. He could have choked me, sir. Oh, he was a right telltale, was Barraclough. Why was your head out of the window in the first place? I was just telling someone to hurry up, sir. He's a liar as well, but he knew he was all right with Melrose because he was his favourite. Then Light... <laughs> then And then Light Taylor wound up the window for no reason, sir. He could have choked me. Melrose didn't say anything. He just looked at Norbert. Norbert looked back at him with a sort of smile on his face. I don't think he meant to be smiling. It was because he was nervous. I'm sick of you, Light Owler. Do you know that? I'm sick and tired of you. You're nothing but a troublemaker. Norbert didn't say anything. His face just twitched a bit. It was dead quiet on the bus. The bell went for assembly and we could hear the other classes filing to school. A troublemaker and a hooligan. You're a disgrace to the school. Do you know that, Light Owler? Yes, sir. And I can't wait for the day that you leave, Light Owler. Neither can I, sir. Melrose's hand moved so fast that it made everybody jump, not just Norbert. It caught him right on the side of the face. His face started going red straight away. Poor old Norbert. I didn't half feel sorry for him. It wasn't fair. He was helping me. Sir, can I... Shut up! Melrose didn't even turn round, and I didn't need telling twice. I shut up. Norbert's cheek was getting redder. He didn't rub it, though. It must have been stinging like anything. He's tough, is Norbert. You're a light, uh, you're a light, light owler. What are you? A light, a light, sir. You haven't even got the decency to wear a school blazer. Norbert was wearing a grey jacket that was miles too big for him. He didn't have a school blazer. Aren't you proud of the school blazer? I suppose so. Why don't you wear one, then? Norbert rubbed his cheek for the first time. I, I haven't got a school blazer, sir. He looked as if he was going to cry. M my mum can't afford one. Nobody moved. Melrose stared at Norbert. It seemed like ages before he spoke. Get out of my sight, Light Owler. Wait in the classroom till we come back from football and get your hands out of your pockets. The rest of you, sit down, be quiet. Melrose went downstairs and told the driver to set off. Tony and me had, the sit had sat on the back seat. As we turned right into Horton Road, I could see Norbert climbing on the school wall, walking along it like a tightrope walker. Melrose must have seen him as well. He really does ask for trouble, does Norbert. It's about a ten minute bus ride to Bankfield Top. You go into town, through the city centre and up Bankfield Road. When we went past the town hall, everybody leaned over to look at the Lord Mayor's Christmas tree. Back in your sights, you've all seen a Christmas tree before. Honestly, Melrose was such a spoil sport. Of course we'd all seen a Christmas tree before, but not as big as that. It must have been about 30 feet tall. There were tons of lights on it as well, and there were lights and decorations all around the square and in the shops. Tony said they were being switched on at half past four that afternoon. He'd read it in the paper, so I'd know it all Gordon Barraclough. Yeah, I read that too. They're being switched on by a mystery celebrity. Ooh, a mystery celebrity. Who's that going to be? A mystery celebrity. Do you know who it is? Gordon looked at me as though I'd asked him what two and two came to. Of course I don't know who it is. Nobody knows who it is. Otherwise it wouldn't be a mystery, would it? He was right there. Well, somebody must know who it is because somebody must have asked him in the first place, mustn't they? Gordon gave me another one of his looks. The Lord Mayor knows, of course he knows, but if you want to find out, you'd have to go and watch the lights being switched on, wouldn't you? Tony said he fancied doing that. I did as well, as long as I wasn't late for coming home for my mum. Yeah, it'd be good, but I'd have to be home by half past five before my mum gets back from work. When we got to Bankfield Top, Melrose told us we had three minutes to get changed. Everybody ran to the temporary changing room. It's always been called the temporary changing room, ever since anyone can remember. We're supposed to be getting a proper place sometime with hot and cold showers and things, but I don't reckon we ever will. The temporary changing room is just a shed. It's got one shower that just runs cold water, 
but even that doesn't work properly. I started getting into my football togs. I tried to make the shorts as short as I could by turning the waistband over a few times, but they still came down to my knees. And the boots were great big heavy things, not like Gordon Barrowclough's Bobby Charlton ones. I could have worn mine on either foot and it wouldn't have made any difference. Gordon was changed first and started jumping up and down and doing all sorts of exercises. He even had a Manchester United tracksuit top on. Come on, Gordon Banks, get out onto the park. Get out onto the park? Just because his dad took him over to see Manchester United every other Saturday, he thought he knew it all. The next hour and a half was the same as usual. Rotten. Gordon and Curly Emmett picked sides, as usual. I went in goal, as usual, and I nearly froze to death, as usual, and I let in 15 goals, as usual. Most of the time, all you could hear was Melrose shouting, Well done, Gordon! Go round him, Gordon! Good deception, Gordon! Give it to Gordon! Shoot, Gordon! Hard luck, Gordon! Ugh, mind you, he did play well, did Gordon. He is the best player in our year. At least today I wasn't on his side, so I didn't have him shouting at me all the time, just scoring against me. I thought Melrose was never going to blow the final whistle. When he did, we all trudged back to the temporary changing room. Even on the way back, Gordon was jumping and up and down and doing all sorts of funny exercises. He was only showing off to Melrose. That's it, Gordon. Keep warm. Keep the muscles supple. Well played, lad. We'll see you get a trial for United yet. Back in the changing room, Gordon started going on about my football kit. He egged everybody else on. Listen, Barraclough, this strip belonged to my uncle and he scored thousands of goals. Gordon just laughed. Your uncle? Your auntie more like, you look like a big girl. Listen, Barraclough, you don't know who my uncle is. I was sick of Gordon Barraclough. I was sick of his bullying and his shouting and his crawling round Melrose and I was sick of him being a good footballer. My uncle is Bobby Charlton. That was a fib. For a split second, I think Gordon believed me. And then he burst out laughing. And so did everyone else. Even Tony laughed. Bobby Charlton, your uncle, you don't expect us to believe that, do you? Believe what you like, it's the truth. Of course, he didn't believe me. And that's why the fib became a lie. Cross my heart and hope to die. I spat on my left hand and they all went quiet. And Gordon put his face close to mine. You're a liar. I was. I'm not. Cross my heart and hope to die. I spat on my hand again. If I'd dropped dead on the spot, I wouldn't have been surprised. Thank goodness Melrose came in and made us hurry on to the bus. Gordon and me didn't talk to each other much for the rest of the day. All afternoon I could see him looking for me. He was so sure I was a liar, but he just couldn't be certain. Why had I been so daft to tell such a stupid lie? Well... It was only really a fib, really, and at least it shut Gordon Barraclough up for the whole afternoon. After, to after school, Tony and me went into town to watch the lights being switched on. Norbert tacked up along as well. He'd forgotten all about his trouble with Melrose that morning. He's like that, Norbert. Me, I'd have been upset for days. There was a crowd at the bottom of the town hall steps, and we managed to get right to the front. Gordon was there already. Norbert was ready for another fight, but we stopped him. When the Lord Mayor came out, we all clapped. He had his chain on and made a special speech about the Christmas appeal. Then it came to switching on the lights. And as you know, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we always try to get someone special to switch on our Chamber of Commerce Christmas lights. And this year is no exception. Let's give a warm welcome to Mr. Bobby Charlton. Couldn't believe it. I nearly fainted. I couldn't move for a few minutes. Everybody asked, was asking for his autograph. When it was Gordon's turn, I saw him pointing at me and I could feel myself going red. Then I saw him waving me over. Not Gordon, Bobby Charlton. I went. Tony and Norbert followed. Gordon was grinning at me. You've had it now. You're in for it now. I told him you said he's your uncle. I looked up at Bobby Charlton. He looked down on me. I could feel my face going redder. Then suddenly he winked at me and smiled. Hello, son. Aren't you going to say hello to your uncle, Bobby, then? I couldn't believe it. Neither could Tony, or Norbert, or Gordon. Or Gordon. Um, hello, Uncle uh, Bobby. He ruffled my hair. How's your mum? All right. He looked at Tony, Norbert and Gordon. Are these your mates? 
Uh, these two are, I pointed out Tony and Norbert. Well, why don't you bring them in for a cup of tea? I didn't understand. I in where? Into the Lord Mayor's parlour for tea. Don't you want to come? Yeah, that'd be lovely, Uncle Bobby. Uncle Bobby? I nearly believed it myself. And I'll never forget the look on Gordon Barracuff's face as Bobby Charlton led Tony Norbert and me into the town hall. He was ever so posh in the Lord Mayor's parlour. He had sandwiches, without crusts, malt loaf and butterfly cakes. It was smashing. So was Bobby Charlton. I just couldn't believe we were there. Suddenly, Tony tried telling, tried, kept trying to tell me something, but I didn't want to listen to him. I wanted to listen to Bobby. Sure up. I'm trying to listen to me Uncle Bobby. But do you know what time it is? It's six o'clock. Six o'clock? Blimey, I've got to get going. My mum will kill me. I said goodbye to Bobby Charlton. Dra, Uncle Bobby. I've got to go now. Thanks. He smiled at me. and I lo He looked at me and smiled. Ta-ra, son. See you again sometime. When we got outside, Tony and Norbert said it was the best tea they'd ever had. I ran home fast as I could. My mum was in already, of course. I was hoping she wouldn't be too worried. Still, I knew everything would be all right once I told her I was late because I'd been having tea in the Lord Mayor's parlour with Bobby Charlton. Where have you been? It's gone quarter past six. I've been worried sick. It's all right, mum. I've been having tea in the Lord Mayor, Mayor's parlour with Bobby Charlton. She gave me such a clout, I thought my head was going to fall off. My mum never believes me, even when I'm telling the truth. Well, wasn't that a brilliant story? And I suppose it tells us all that really, there is no such thing as little fib. It'll always find you out. We'll see you again for another story time very soon.